You're listening to The Sting of Mortality. Chapter 6, Part 7. Blood and Brine. At first light, Leclove was greeted by pain in his rib cage and a thirst so terrible he felt as if he had swallowed a bag of broken glass. Rough hands feverishly clutched his rib cage as he leaned up onto the little rowboat and glanced out to the shivering waves searching for land, but saw nothing. With a wince, he pulled off his torn shirt and craned his neck to examine the horrid gash. It was deep, raw, and red. He knew if he didn't do something soon, it would be inflamed and infected. He clenched his teeth as he sat up and glanced about the little rowboat for anything that he could use. The thought of stitching the cut back together with the loose fishing hook and a line briefly popped into his head, and then he quickly decided against it. For one, he couldn't see what he was doing to complete the task, and secondly, sewing with a used rusty old fish hook would only serve to grow an even worse infection. It was then he spotted the lantern swing at the front of the little boat. Upon further examination, he found it was still quite full with oil. Leclove grimaced and took a deep breath. He knew what he needed to do, but he wasn't at all excited about it. Slowly, methodically, he fished out a lighter from his pocket and lit the lantern and set the edge of his metal belt buckle onto the flame. He could have used a blade, but he didn't want to risk ruining the temper of the steel. He waited for the metal to get hot. The clove somberly took a handful of fresh white packing salt. This should keep things nice and fresh, he seethed. As much as the salt stung, the clove set his eyes on the lantern flame, heating the metal edge until it began to take a dim orange glow. Nothing like the smell of bacon and eggs in the morning, he cursed. And with the deep breath, he pulled the hot belt buckle off the small flame. The severed valley of raw flesh and meat hissed and steamed as he seared it shut, turning it into what would become a gruesome scar. Seething in anguish, the clove tossed aside the belt buckle and glanced about. His throat was dry, and the sun now beat down over him, cooking him inside and out. Washing off his belt, he scooped up a cool hands full of salt water and splashed his face, trying to ease the horrid thirst. He couldn't remember being so thirsty. His throat ached more than his cauterized wound. Every swallow was painful. But all he had on board was a bag full of salt and a rusted hook and some fishing line. Too exhausted to row, he blew out the lantern and settled back down and did his best to rest. A little while later, he woke as the sun was going down. He could not sleep anymore. Every breath was agony. He looked about in dismay as the sun that he had been hiding from all day now left him shivering in the cold dark. Just as he attempted to, to lay back down, he heard it. 
he heard the sound of rain. And moments later, he felt the cool droplets. It came slow, one sparse drop at a time. Le Clove opened his parched mouth, hoping for a few drops to land on his tongue. But the one droplet he did catch was in his eye, and the next on his forehead. And then, just as he opened his mouth to curse at the sky, as if by some cruel joke, the clouds let it all go at once, and suddenly he was caught in a gray downpour. Le Clove used his torn shirt to squeeze the fresh water into his mouth. Never before had water tasted so sweet. Laughing, Le Clove took off his boots and his socks, doing anything and everything to collect more water. Le Clove drank and drank until he doubled over, sick, and then drank and drank some more. Splashing about in the little rowboat like a toddler might in a wash basin. Until suddenly he realized the life-giving water was beginning to get too high and threatening to sink him. A clove cursed again as now he began bailing out the little boat. Blood and brine! he exclaimed in frustration. Fortunately, after several hours... The heavy rains slowly faded away. Sleep-deprived, dull yellow eyes slowly scanned the clear blue horizon up ahead. A tired grin formed as he recalled the old rhyme. Red sky in the morning, sailors take warning. Something, something, something. It's about time I get a bit of luck, he declared. Feeling warmed and refreshed, the clove used a bit of cloth to bait the hook on the end of the fish line and tossed it over the end. I just need to catch a fish and get to shore, he mused out loud. When he glanced up, he saw a small white speck off in the distance. It was a sail. It was another ship. Unable to contain his excitement, Le Clove quickly secured his belt and held up the flat of his blade, using it to catch the sun so that he might possibly signal the ship. Time passed. Le Clove began to wonder if any of his efforts had been noticed or if they were all for nothing. When the bow of the ship began to veer toward him, White spray could be seen as the bow of the ship crashed over the gentle deep blue swells as it drew near, dwarfing his little rowboat. The clothes grin faded as he gazed up at the twisted, cheerful faces of the shady figures who leaned out over the side of the railing as they brandished their weapons. The weapons in their hands did not alarm them as much as the cruel, twisted grins on their faces. But under his current situation, there was no escaping them. The lines were cast down, and his little rowboat was quickly secured. The clove kept his sword blade close to his side as he clambered over the railing, all the while keeping his movements slow and deliberate masking his pain and extent of his injuries the best he could. The crew gathered around, drinking strong mead, while others lazily blew smoke rings with their pipes. Le Clove became still as he felt the cold of weight from the flat of a blade on his shoulder. Hope you have money, because we don't have freeloaders aboard our ship came a gruff voice from behind him. The clove closed his eyes. He couldn't help but wonder what it would be like when something good could happen. A day without magic, or some kind of spell being cast on him. A day without bandits or vampires. What he would give for a simple day, when he wasn't lost or hungry or running from something. 
<laughs> How did you get on then? Hucklove asked, leaving the rather large, dumbfounded brute at a loss for words. All at once, the crew burst out into drunken laughter, spilling their mead. Others even dropped their weapons as they rolled near tears on the floor. Unfortunately, the man in front of him responded differently and pulled out a large dagger from his belt. In one single fluid upward stroke, the clove severed the man's hand at the wrist. Instantly, he fell to the ground, screaming in agony as he stared at the bloody stump. The clove held the bloody tip of his sword upward and methodically turned, preparing for the rest of the crew to rush him. Drunken laughter came to eerie, sobering silence. Instead of attacking, they quickly backed away, every eye glued on Sangra Luna's shimmering bronze hilt. The clove grimly turned, his feverish yellow eyes rested onto a large bald-headed man with black tribal tattoos, who stood at the helm of the ship, his chiseled arms braced firmly at his side, and his stern green eyes fixed with intense observation. By his posture and by those around him, it was obvious he was the captain of the ship. The clove slowly licked his dry lips and squinted his feverish eyes as he glanced around, noting the fear of the crew. I'm thirsty, he announced. The bald-headed man turned and nodded. A large horn of mead was poured and presented to the stranger. One hand on the large horn of mead and one on his sword. The clove's feverish yellow eyes distantly gazed down at the cup of mead and put it to his cracked lips and slowly stepped forward. But as he moved forward, his nostrils were bombarded with a terrible, odious stench that overpowered even his own carcass and the ragged crews combined that came rising from the large wooden grating below him. The clove glanced downward to see dozens of eyes staring up at him in the brig. Half-naked men, women, and children were crammed in shackles, pressed against one another, dwelling in their own filth. The sight was appalling. It sickened him and made his chest burn with anger. However, he was weak and severely wounded, and so he contained his anger the best he could. That... Is some blade you have there, remarked the large, bald-headed man. The clove grimly took another quiet drink from the large cup of mead. It was bittersweet, and it numbed the pain. Distant memories flooded his fevered mind. He remembered holding Nobetha's frail body as she bled in his arms remembered the vow he had given her as she lay dying. The clove took another drink from the horn. The clove had never been one to drink, but being in pain and suffering from dehydration and running a fever made the strong drink necessary, despite it having a profound effect on his already rattled mind. The pain melted away. His face was warm, leaving only rising anger. Yes, it is, the clove replied. Just then, his vision blurred. Voices and shadows of the past began to bombard his senses. Suddenly, his yellow eyes came to life. They burned with a terrible light. The clove turned, slashed the nearest man across the throat with a single stroke of his sword. But before he could kill again, a sharp, dull, searing pain of a heavy, blunt object cracked across his head. 
A clove crumpled to the floor, and his bloodied sword clattered onto the wooden deck at the captain's feet. The big bald-headed man with the tattoos stood in front of him, quietly studying his confiscated weapon, while the rest of the crew quickly pounced on top of the disoriented warrior and quickly bound his hands behind his back. Captain Russick gazed down as the day's captive was quickly forced up to his knees. Who are you? he demanded again. But the yellow-eyed stranger refused to speak. O'Clo's eyes snapped open, and he quickly attempted to rise, only to be knocked back down to his knees, and his head was dunked into a barrel of seawater. Just as Uclo was certain his lungs would burst, yet they yanked him out by his hair. Drossig gripped the sword thoughtfully and glared down at the prisoner as he watched him cough and splutter and gasp for air. Where did you get this? He demanded loudly to catch his prisoner's attention. <coughs> I found it lodged in a tree, he rasped. Drossa grinned as he pulled out a fine cloth and began cleaning the blood away from the sword. I have a feeling you're worth a lot of money. To some very powerful people, he mused out loud. Care to enlighten us? We may, perhaps, will make your voyage a little more comfortable. <laughs> so far, no one's lived to spend it, Leclerc chuckled. Drusik paused. He met the young warrior's intense yellow-eyed stare and held the sword up to the sunlight, examining the inscriptions carefully. Well, you don't have the Black Crescent, so it was not given to you. Perhaps you stole it, he prompted. I won it, Leclerc grunted. Ha <laughs> ha! Captain Drossick laughed. Did you beat a vampire at a card game? He scoffed. Leclove grinned. Not a card game, he chuckled in amusement. What are you? Drossick demanded. Uh, your worst nightmare, Leclove growled. Drossick stepped forward and punched Leclove across the face. The impact sent the young warrior's head back, and droplets of scalding blood flying in the opposite direction. The sailors jumped back, cursing in both pain and dismay as it scalded their skin. Take him below, Drusik ordered. The news about the death of Helix would no doubt spread quickly, but Ebony Oscro had not been expecting, nor was he prepared for such a visit as the shadow of Lord Moonthrall's black ship fell over the small fishing village as it flew beneath the full moon, sailing directly toward his mansion. A dozen shades quickly ran out to secure the anchor lines of the flying ship as it settled down into the courtyard, while Ebony Oscaro came out to greet Lord Moonthrall. Crescenta followed behind her sire's flowing black cloak as he moved impatiently down into the courtyard. Ebony Oscaro gave up a slight but formal bow to his honor his esteemed guest. What a surprise to see you, High Lord Moonthrall. However, Lord Moonthrall was in no mood for formalities. I have tracked a person of interest into your region. I want forty shades to help us in the search, Moonthrall commanded. Ebony Oscarl paused as if something had been stuck in his throat. <coughs> well, um, I, of course, would happily lend you forty of my best shades. And, unfortunately, I can only lend you twenty, he said at last. 
Mundal frowned and turned around to face him. What? he demanded. Ebony Oscar grimaced as he hesitantly placed his fingertips together. We had a small rebellion, he began and swallowed hard before he continued. Many of my servants were ambushed and killed, including a fellow child of the night. We, of course, retaliated. I'm sure whomever you seek is most likely amongst the dead. He shrugged. I am, of course, terribly sorry for the inconvenience. Crescenta turned and glanced curiously to see her master, the High Lord. Moonthrall would respond to Ebony Oscar's grievous claims. Moonthrall's thin, pale nostrils flared in anger. Ebony Oscro, I swear, if you are hiding that staff, I will have you bound in an iron-spiked inlaid coffin and thrown into the bottomless abyss for all eternity, he seethed. Ebony Oscar blinked. Staff? What staff? he asked. Holderness staff! The pyro was the last to have it, Moonthrall snapped impatiently. Ebony Oscar swallowed hard. I see. The last I've heard was that Alderneth had it, he remarked in a hushed voice. Moonthrall's chilling response echoed in the crisp night air. Alderneth is dead. The staff belongs to me now, he replied coldly. A long, dismal silence followed. How exactly did he die? Ebony Rosco asked carefully. There was a broken spear in his chest, but who or what put it there? I have no idea. I keep hearing about a man with yellow eyes. Perhaps he's a dragon. Perhaps not. A cold chill ran through Ebony Oscar's spine as he remembered the warrior's molten yellow eyes gazing back at him. And he grimaced. This one you speak of. It is possible he may still be alive, he hissed in contempt. But he was wounded. And the last I heard, he went for a swim. So far, we haven't recovered a body. Yet, he added quickly. Moonthrall clenched his teeth, began to pace back and forth. Did he have the staff with him when he was wounded? Nobody that I know has a record of seeing him carrying any sort of staff. If he had one, he must have hidden it someplace. Moonthrall cursed and turned away and closed his eyes. The wind. He began and then turned and tilted his head curiously. It speaks of a warrior with yellow eyes like the harvest moon. He's called the dragon scourge. Enthrallum's foe. And the sting of mortality. What could that mean? Ebony Oscar asked. Moonthrall let out a slow gust of air through his nostrils. <sighs> Whether the wind speaks of the past or future, I am uncertain. We must consult the council and inform King Afflegger. 
he declared somberly. Up next, chapter seven. A rusty nail. You're listening to The Sting of Mortality by M. R. R. Lopez. If you would uh, like to support this channel or read along, there are books on Amazon and Kindle. Keep in mind, I am an independent writer, a one-man band. Not everything will be perfect, but uh, I am grateful for your support. And chapter 7 is coming up next. <laughs>